Welcome to episode 6 of the American Noise Podcast, hosted by Andrew Stiles. Tonight is the eve of the XFL as I'm recording this. This will go out right before the first game starts. And we will be taking a look at every single team in the Eastern Division, since we're pretty much out of time here. So this will be a bit of a supersized episode. No long intro music to try to pad out the running time. We're going to have plenty of time to go over each of these four teams, their effect on the odds, and even a bit of week one banter before the official preview episode for that that'll be out here tomorrow, which I hope will actually be a live stream, in fact. But anyways, the first team we're going to do is going to be a parallel to the Wildcats, as in, like, LA is one of the two cities that had an OGXFL team. New York was the other. And New York also hosted an NFL team in their stadium, just like LA has, whether it was the old Chargers soccer stadium or now, in this case, for the Guardians, the Jets and G- Giants stadium. Both of them hosted NFL teams in the last fall. Both of them were OGXFL cities. Very similar. Uh, one thing that's not similar is the coaching. While Winston Moss has been around for a, not forever, but he's been around for a while and is the only defensive-minded coach from the league, Kevin Gilbride is extremely offensive-minded. He's been an offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach and everything for several decades. The thing is, he's been retired for the last six years, and some will say, well, Stoops was retired for two or three years. He might be a bit inexperienced. Well, if you're going to say that to Stoops, then you're going to have to say way more about Gilbright. Gilbright has been retired for six years before taking up this position. Of course, it doesn't seem like he's gotten rusty. The Guardians seem to be in the top half of XFL teams, and if not, then they are easily in fifth. At least that's according to the Vegas odds. And after uh, recent events, which we will cover in the week one episode about Balox and Renegades, I'm starting to think Vegas doesn't understand some of the stuff like how a starting injured quarterback does not mean you line the move in line in favor of the, quarter, the team who has the injured quarterback by three points. That doesn't work like that. But anyways, the New York Guardians were announced on August 21st with their logo and such, like every other team, except for the unfortunate Seattle Dragons who got leaked. Gilbride was announced back on April 16th, just the day after the, you turned in all of your taxes. But yeah, after that 10 season set of the Giants and the 6 year retirement, Kelvin Gilbride is back to head coach, GM, and offensive coordinates the New York Guardians. He does have a defensive coordinator in Jim Herman, but Gilbride is coaching, drill managing, and offensive coordinating. I don't believe anyone else in the league is taking over the offensive coordinator role from someone else except for Gilbride. So yeah, he is doing a bit of extra work. He's going to call plays for certain. We know that. He did not take over quarterback's coach. He did leave that to G.A. Magnus. So he isn't trying to pull off four jobs. But instead of pulling off the usual two, he will try to pull off three. Now, he does have a quarterback for him to start with. That is Matt McGloin, an assigned Tier 1 QB. And despite many people in fantasy believing he's good, the general consensus among the XFL community is he is one of the weaker QBs. Which, I mean, you're already going to be third after whatever Josh Johnson and Landry Jones do. That's not giving you much room. But he was the walk-on quarterback for Penn State, the first one to get the starting role since scholarships had been instated in 1949. So he's a trailblazer in that regard. But that's pretty much been his only true accomplishment except for being a journeyman backup for Raiders, Eagles, Texans, and Chiefs. McGloin's backup is Marquise Williams, and then finally in third string, he might move up to backup. Uh, remember when I said the Wildcats traded Lewis Press? Well, this is who they traded him to. Another similarity between the Wildcats and the Giants is now they have both employed Lewis Perez as a QB. Only in this case, he is a backup instead of a starter. Of course, Perez is known for his time in the Birmingham Iron. And for being an immense game manager who was mainly carried by a powerful defense... And the fact that he could not throw a touchdown despite a winning record to save his own skin. So that's a problem. He is going to likely third string, in all honesty, so we may not see much of him this season. And the running game is pretty strong. It's led by Tim Cook and Darius Victor. Justin Stockton might get a hand in it. 
is probably going to be one of the better running games in the league. The wide receiver unit is led by Colby Pearson, Mikel McKay, who in some cases could be a top five wide receiver, and Austin Duke will carry off the ZWR position. Uh, tight end duties. Apparently the Guardians are going to be one of those teams that do love tight ends. They've stacked up on four of them. Mainly the two Jakes will be the starters. That is Jake Powell and Jake Sutherland. The offensive line is anchored by the center of Ian Silberman. They do not have a backup left guard or right tackle for week one. They're going to play a bit of a risk. Left tackle will be Anthony Cole and John King will take over the right tackle position. Cole's left guard. Uh, right guard goes to Garrett Bumfield. Left tackle will go to Jaron Jones. On the defensive line, uh, that seems to be a 4-3 setup. The right end will be Bumney Rotmi for week one. Uh, the two tackles will be a 3-T and an NT, a nose tackle. TJ Barnes and Joey MBU are likely, and I know I'm going to say that name wrong, but look at his name, Joey MBU. It, you have to say it like university. How, how do you pronounce that? I, I'd love to see an announcer pronounce that. I dare you. But they will be the main defensive stalwarts on that side of the line. And then finally, Kevin Walker will hold the left end position. In the linebacking core, Bryce Jones, Dravon Askew Henry, DeJulian Hines, and Ben Henney will all have a sizable role. Uh, Garrett Dooley might also get a move in. And then finally, the cornerback position. Uh, we got Jamar Summers, Andrew Soar, and NJ Hendy. Now, the way the depth chart is, is they almost want to roll with a 4-4 four, four set and leave with three cornerbacks. Because there is a right end, a left end, a 3 teen NT, which are defensive ends that are just more specialized, a WLB, an MLB, an SLB, and an NCB, which technically is more of a linebacker position when you think about it. That's pretty much a 4-4 setup. We might see him go to a bit of 4-3, but it almost seems to be run heavy, which, considering the way the league is designed, you got to think you got to defend against the pass at all costs. I mean, even the running stats from we got from scrimmages seem to be very low compared to the passing stats, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, Justin Vogel on the specialist, he's going to hold for the kickers. Uh, Scott Daly is the long... I'm sorry. I'm trying to look at PT and H. But Scott Daly is the long snapper. Uh, Justin Vogel is going to get some punting duties. And finally, Matt McCrane will be the place kicker. Of course, it seems that the Guardians love their MMs. I mean, you got Matt McCrane and Mikhail McKay. MMs. Go ahead and smart to these guys. In fact, sponsor them in a way so we can get Seattle and New York for the finals, and we can have, or not finals, but Eastern Conference, and we can get Skittles, Seattle versus M&M's New York. Come on. Come on, let's, let's go all the way with that. Anyways, while they are in some cases favored by many to even outright win the East, they are facing who was the early Eastern Darlings until recent injury issues, particularly to one Antonio Callaway, and that is the Vipers of the XFL. And honestly, this team might have been a bit overrated. Because in the odds, they're dropping like a rock now that Callaway is gone. He looked to be the best talent wide receiver. He's on your reserve. We don't know if he'll be back. They have problems. They do play at Raymond James Stadium. The Guardians haven't played at MetLife. Uh, Raymond James will host WrestleMania this year. So the Vipers are guaranteed a Week 9 road game. And the Vipers are led by Mark Trestman. Mark Trestman is very notable to certain fans who will be following this. He is a very famous CFL coach. He is perhaps the modern offensive genius of the Canadian Football League. That is one of the reasons along that they're ranked so high. Bob Stoops is the reason Dallas is ranked so high. And Mark Trestman is the reason the, the Vipers are ranked so high. Christmas was announced all the way back on March 5th. Again, GM and head coach. His offensive coordinator will be Jim, Jamie Elizondo. And most notably, Jerry Glanville is back. Defensive coordinator he is. 
78 years young. He's got one more run in him. We'll see how he does. But it's if you're looking for a more legendary coach, or at least the most legendary coordinator in this league, Jerry Glanville is definitely it. Uh, this isn't the first time Florida's had a spring football team. Uh, of course, the Orlando Apollos just took shop up here last year. And Spurrier, which may have been the blueprint for the reason why Stoops and Trestman's teams were so favored, uh, pretty much ran Red Shaw for the Alliance until they folded and was probably going to be the league champion. Maybe Arizona would have stopped them. I mean, Arizona did beat them in the regular season, but anyways, off topic. And it seems that Florida skill might have transferred from Spurrier to Trestman. So we'll see how that works. His quarterback does leave cause for concern. Aaron Murray had an awful Legends campaign last year. Of course, some would attribute that to the fact that the head coach was gone and they went through three different offensive coordinators in the season. But it revolving doors it was, you got to at least provide some hope if you're really that good of a QB. Of course, Tressman is a lot more stable, and this is probably his one chance to redeem himself. Backing him up, uh, we've got Taylor Cornelius and... Perhaps the most unusual situation is the situation of Quentin Flowers. He is probably going to be a Taysen Hill of the XFL. He is technically the third QB on the depth chart. That does not mean he will not be seeing the field all season. It is likely on some trick plays he will throw the ball in one of those double forward pass plays. Uh, Murray would just lateral slash forward pass to Flowers and he'd throw it down the field. He could line up in the slot. He could go out of the backfield as a running back. There are so many things he can do. He is the X factor of this team. He is their impact player. He is their Langey Jones. Their Sean Oakman. In actual running backs, uh, Devon Smith and Jaquise Patrick will lead the backfield. Mac Brown is coming up in reserve. Wide receiver, Jalen Tolliver and Dan Williams will be backing up Reese Horn. The wide receiving core still looks really darn good despite the fact that Callaway is gone. If Callaway was there, it would likely for certain be the best receiving core in the league. He's not, so it isn't, and we'll see how that goes. Uh, both the guard positions lack backups come in week one. Gerald Foster at left guard and Durante Bolden at right guard. The left tackle and right tackle positions do have backups, so to center. March has Ivy will cover left tackle. Right tackle goes to Isaiah Williams, and Jordan McRae will hold down the trenches at center. Moving over to the defensive line, we got four linemen. Josh Banks, Nico Whitlock, and in reserve, Ricky Walker will hold over the defensive tackle positions come week one. Jason Neal and Delantes Mount will hold on side the edges of the trenches. Linebackers are mainly Lucas Waka, uh, Terence Plummer, Emmanuel Beal, and Reggie Northup. But there's only two linebacker positions on the depth chart. We have two cornerback positions, an NCB, which is a linebacker slash cornerback, and a strong safety, and a free safety. So it's almost like they're really, as in the opposite of the Guardians, they are selling out for the pass instead of selling out for the run, which I honestly believe is a lot better. But yeah. The nickelback will go to Micah Hammerman. Cornerbacks are Sheltus Lewis and Athola Kelly. Strong safety goes to Robert Pristiner. And the free safety is Marcellus Branch. Jake Shum will punt. Andrew Franks is likely to hold both the kickoff and place kicking duties. Nick Moore will long snap. Uh, we actually have confirmed kicker and punt returners. Uh, unusual standard for the Death Drop actually in week one. Randall Hill will be recovering all kicks and punts as seen fit. Uh, Ryan Davis and Reese Horn could also get some chances to do that, especially if Randall Hall gets some sort of freak injury. So, you know, he could always pull that off. But anyways, yeah, that's about it for the Vipers. And the East is a very confusing situation. Vipers were the early favorite. Uh, a lot of people are starting to realize, except for if Peppa Hamilton's experience, then yeah, that's a weakness. But the defenders have no serious weak points. Uh, Vipers led by Trestman. The Guardians have an all-around strong running game. 
there's really no weak teams in the division except for the St. Louis Battlehawks. They've got problems. Now, if they go into Dallas and beat a, a banged-up team in Week 1, this will look far different. If they lose to them, it just confirms that, yep, football may be back in St. Louis, but the Rams were awful for the last dozen years in the city, and the Battlehawks will just continue the tradition. The one person who can turn that around is Jordan Tamu, the starting quarterback. Kirla Heineke is his backup. Nick Fitzgerald is the third stringer. Of course, Jonathan Hayes is coaching and general managing the team. The offensive coordinator is Chuck Long, and Jay Hayes, the defensive coach. And again, with St. Louis, this is the only city in the league that has not had an NFL team play in the fall. Last season, of course, they did have the Rams, and... Now it's sim instead of some Ram team, whatever is now the what is it? What do they call it? Is it the Dome at America Center? Yes, yes, it is the Dome at America Center, the old Ram Stadium. They got the lower bowl all opened up for it, and they also have the most Twitter followers. They are fighting for the most ticket sales with a couple of teams. Seattle and DC mainly are selling out their stadiums right now, especially DC. So Ballox may not have the most ticket sales, but they have the most interactive fan base again. Seattle has the most ticket sales. Bellox has the most Twitter followers. Why, at least according to Vegas, are these the two worst teams in the league? That stinks. But hopefully they'll be able to pull this off. And if they don't, well, that's going to really hurt the league long term, I think. St. Louis and Seattle, as much as I dislike St. Louis as baseball tradition 2011, we need them to be at least get four wins. Just get four wins. <laughs> And their one chance to do that is that the fact they do have an impact player. If the Roughnecks, or not Rough, well, I guess Roughnecks running back is pretty good too, but if the running is running back, Cameron Artis Payne is the best in the league, then Christine Michael sure is. Week one, especially with the injury to Landry Jones, could be a battle of the running backs. And Christine Michael could actually carry the battle hawks in that regard. Matt Jones will back him up, and Keith Ford is the final reserve option. LaDamian Washington and Alonzo Russell are the backup wide receivers in a way. They're the second throw on the field. To the slot wide receiver, DeMonre Pearson L. He is their main guy. He's a slot wide out. He's going to try to Tyreek Hill defenses. Speed kills, especially in a league like this. If you just haul it in, then your feet will do the rest. Marcus Lewis will roll out from tight end. West Saxon is his backup. The O-line only has one player standing alone without emergency support, and that is Ken Perkins, a right guard. He will be helped to right tackle by Matt McCants, another MM alliteration. The center goes to Brian Fulkerts, left guard is to Bruno Regan, and Jay Campos will hold over left tackle. In the trenches, Will Clark, Casey Stiles, Channing Ward, and Andrew and Nakara are likely to be the main defensive linemen. The main inside linebackers, uh, Terrence Gavin and Dexter McCoyle. And for certain, there's no nickelback trickery or full cornerback, whatever trickery. There's three cornerbacks, a free safety and a strong safety. It is a five-cornerback set. Darius Hillary, David Ritterers, DeMonte Wade are the three main cornerbacks. And the safeties are Kenny Robinson, one of the, probably the leader on that defense, and Will Hill. Punter is Marquette King. DeMonre Pearson L. in his... Slot duties is also going to hold over the punting return duties. Taylor Russino will kick. Keith Munfrey will do kicking returns. Again, Pearson with the punting returns. Taylor Carew will long snap. And perhaps for the sleeper favorite in not just the Eastern Division, but the entire league, the DC Defenders. They play at a soccer stadium like the Wildcats did. And the Chargers did. Wildcats will, Chargers did. That was a soccer stadium before the Chargers moved in. They'll be playing at Audi Field, the home of DC United. There's been many DC United fans who think that field's going to be messed up by that. All the photos suggest otherwise, but hey, have your fun, pal. I mean, MLS is having worse range than the AAF did. And the AAF was on CBSSN, and the MLS was on FS1. Yeah. Totally a well-drawn... To totally just... Totally shows that Americans truly love soccer and not like the rip-off version of football or anything. Yes, I know soccer was created first. I don't think any person in America actually cares about that. 
Uh, some do, but they're few and far between. Of course, the Defenders' main story is they have maybe not the best QB in the league. Of course, Justin Jones and not just Jones, Josh Johnson and Landry Jones exist. But another Jones has entered the fold. Cardell Jones, his backup Tyree Jackson is the only back on the death chart come week one. Cardell Jones is definitely the person that this team will live and die on in success. He is their main guy. He's probably the most promoted QB, except for maybe Landry Jones in the build-up. He is their guy. If he fails, the team fails. If he succeeds, the team succeeds. It's about as simple as that. Of course, their main weakness, it's if Cardell Jones doesn't collapse, is Peppa Hamilton's relative inexperience. His most recent job was just being an assistant of the Michigan Wolverines football team. So, yeah, this is a bit low. All he was was just an assistant head coach and passing game coordinator. He, before that, was an assistant head coach and quarterback's coach to the 2016 Cleveland Browns because that totally wasn't an absolute collapse of a team. <laughs> so, good luck there, pal. Hopefully your inexperience isn't brutalized, such a bunch of talent with no weak spots. Uh, Tanner Engstrand is the offensive coordinator and running back's coach. And in another twist... The defensive coordinator also has a coaching role in positions. Uh, both defensive coordinator and secondary coaching duties go to Louis Coffey. Uh, running back goes to Jarrell Presley and Donald Prumphy. They're the main running backs. DeAndre Tompkins and Rashad Ross have the main wide receiver in duties. You might also see Mikel Dupree get rolled out there. Tight end goes to Kari Lee. Left guard is the only non-backup position in week one in the offensive line. Dorian Johnson stands alone. Left tackle will be DeAndre Wesley. To the right of Johnson will be the center, John Toff. And to his right are the right guard and right tackle, Richard Cook and Malcolm Bunchy, respectively. The defense, nose tackle is Elijah Quells. On either side of him is Tracy Sprinkle and Jay Bromley. Linebacking core is Antonia Williams, A.J. Tharpley, Jamar Thurman and Keyshawn Threeman. It is a 3-4 three, set, three linemen, four linebackers. The four cornerback set, uh, left cornerback and right cornerback, Elijah Campbell and Desmond Lawrence, respectively, and Matt Elam and Carl's Merritt will be the final line of defense in the secondary at the safety positions. There is no confirmed punt returner or kick returner yet. We do know Ty Rossa will be setting up kicks, despite a valiant attempt by PFT commentator to get a starting job, Mr. 35-yarder. Uh, Hunter Niswander will be the punter. And finally, the long snapper goes to Brian Cowery. The odds are in the favor of the Guardians, the Vipers, and the Defenders. While the Wildcats and Roughnecks have an outside shot, Unless the Renegades screw it up, the Renegades are probably going to win the West. The East is very different. If the Battlehawks don't show up, there are still likely going to be three contending teams, even by as late as Week 8 or 9, the way things are shipping up. Especially if Pep Hamilton is in inexperienced, Kevin Gilbride hits his trend early despite six-year retirement, and finally, can Aaron Murray show that he was a product of a failed system at the Atlanta Legends, and show that under Trestman, he can be a great QB. We'll see how it goes. That's pretty much it for this episode. Despite the fact that it's lasted 24 minutes, it felt rather quick. Uh, and folks, Saturday is here. It's football season. We will have a pick em episode. I've already set out my picks and the comps levels for each. I'm not feeling happy about my own running against chances. We'll see how that goes. And folks, it's football season. We got 12 weeks. We have all the money we need. We aren't going to worry about shuttering in mid-season, unlike a certain other league. We're ready. All this to do is to play good quality football and be entertaining. Let's go and do that. See you on the field.